Um, okay, so uh, as, a, uh, as a starter, um, as you probably know, augmented and uh, virtual and mixed realities are not novelties anymore. They are, they are everywhere. Uh, and oh, uh, I can hear myself pretty loudly. That's <laughs> Um, this new system, I just heard about it, and uh, it's terrible because you're going to hear all my mistakes in English in very high definition. I'm, I'm, that's terrible. Uh, so for, for those of you who uh, aren't familiar with the uh, three technologies, uh, here's a quick recap of the difference. Uh, virtual reality is when you go to a completely virtual environment, for example, a video game. Uh, mixed reality is when you see reality and some virtual stuff also at the same time. For example, if you add a cartoon character uh, in this room. Uh, and augmented reality is when you see the reality but with some more information. For example, if you look uh, at this stage and uh, you see our names and functions appear next to our faces. In the, in the cultural institutions, uh, these technologies are used to create uh, new experiences and narratives. Uh, this can dramatically change the way work has to be done. Uh, so that's why in this panel we will discuss how the missions and professions are, are affected. Uh, so, um, as uh, Diane already introduced you, uh, I think we're going to start uh, right now. Um, so, we're going to start we, with you, uh, Brandon. Uh, you're the founder and CEO of Qsium, and uh, you have uh, five minutes. Yeah, well, thank you so much. Uh, it's nice to be here. It's great to see everybody. I'm really excited to jump into the topic. But before I do, I want to give a quick little synopsis of who I am and how I got to be here. I started designing and developing technology at the age of 11 years old and found myself fascinated with how art, design, music and entertainment all intertwined. I used that as a tool to break into the music industry and I was working with Katy Perry, Mick Jagger and Lenny Kravitz before I could legally drink alcohol. Based in the United States at age is 21, I think I was 18 at the time. Um, I had a unique opportunity to work with a museum in New York City and quickly saw how painful, frustrating, expensive and obsolete all of the digital tools in their hands were. And that became the catalyst to starting QZM, where we help museums, cultural institutions and public attractions engage their visitors, members and donors using the power of technology. We've worked with everybody from MoMA to the White House and organizations every shape and size in between. Um, today, I'll talk a little bit about our work in augmented reality. Um, we've been working in mobile specifically for many, many years and had the opportunity to work on a variety of projects, which I will hopefully be able to pull up on the screen behind me. I don't know where this. I don't know where the slides are. Um, so hopefully someone will be able to pull them up. Pull them up. But uh, before, okay. if if we actually can start to um, give the speech to someone else, because oh, we, okay. we have a technical issue now. Okay. Well, I apologize. <laughs> the slides. Apologize uh, for the for the short delay. Uh, when the slides are available, I will tell you about work with the Perez Art Museum, a project with the Isabella Stewart Gardner Museum, some survey work, and a European project uh, with the Museum of Applied Arts uh, in Vienna, Austria. Okay. So Rose, you're a Director of International Relations and Development at the Tower of David Museum in Jerusalem. Go ahead. Okay, hi. Do we have slides for me? Or no? Okay, I'm going to start anyway. <coughs> My name is Rose Genosar, and I am from Jerusalem, from the Tower of David. Yes? Okay. Um, I think that we are almost the antithesis of, uh, of David here because um, of, excuse me, not David, Brendan. Brendan, of Brendan, because I'm from the Museum of the History of Jerusalem. We tell three and a half thousand years of history. It's... Um, it's a place that rather than coming from the 20th century, we're actually coming maybe from the 8th century BC. Um, we were faced, uh, here we are, okay, oops, where do I have, did you give me the clicker? I think I gave you my mic as well. You did. <laughs> Take mine. <laughs> Everything's good now. <laughs> okay, except it's not clicking. Do you know how? We can hear the MacBook error sound. <laughs> <laughs> okay. 
All right. Um, we come from a place where we believe and we want and we have a passion for communicating the authenticity of an object, the authenticity of a site, the authenticity of an artifact. Um, we honestly believe, and I think probably everybody in the cultural heritage uh, sector believes, that nothing compares, nothing can, can you just, yeah, that nothing can compare with actually touching an object, with putting your hand on a thousand year old stone, looking at, at an artifact that opens up a vista, an, uh, kind of an essence, an aura of, uh, of timelessness. What we do know, though, is that there is a younger generation where we have to find ways to communicate that kind of authenticity. And that's why we turned to, to the idea of virtual reality. Um, <clears throat> we actually have a number of projects that we are developing. We began with the idea of developing an innovation lab within the, within the confines of this thousand-year-old structure. Um, the idea was, if we could reach a larger audience, both as supporters and both as visitors, by using technology, we could reopen this world of history and show it to people. So what, what guides us so far in this exploration is that we use virtual, virtual reality not as a, uh, as a substitute for reality, it's not to usher someone into a room and put on glasses and transport them back in time. It's exactly the opposite. We have, for example, guided tours where we have our guides taking people either through some of the archaeological excavations on, the, on site or in the city of Jerusalem beyond. And at certain points when we say, but 2,000 years ago, this wasn't here. 2,000 years ago, put on your glasses. No, put on the, uh, the virtual reality glasses and be transported back in time, but that, that whole experience is still mediated by a human being. And this is really what is guiding us. Also, we're, we're developing AR, uh, an AR experience right now, but that, te that takes place within the gallery of the museum and brings that atmosphere to life. Our idea is, is really to get to the person and say, I don't want to look at, at the virtual anymore, now I want to touch the real thing. I think that's where we're going with the virtual reality and uh, that's what we're aiming for. Um, maybe uh, we can bug come back to Brendan, um, if that's good. <laughs> cool, um, thank you. Is so. That, yeah. Good. Yeah, um, so to dive in uh, and to continue where we left off, we had the opportunity to work with the Perez Art Museum in Miami, Florida on what became the first example of a 100% AR-based art exhibition in the world. And it also marked the first ever instance of Apple's AR kit, Apple's augmented reality framework in the museum and cultural climate. Um, this was debuted um, not this past year, but the year before that at Miami Art Basel, which is the largest international festival where people come all over the world um, to look at contemporary art. The museums and cultural institutions step up. And so this exhibition, what is unique about it, other than the, the details I mentioned earlier, was that it defies a scale and a budget that a physical project uh, would have had to create larger than life interactive pieces. And it also has no expiration date. So for a museum like uh, the Prez Art Museum, this will be up indefinitely and was also an iterative exhibition. So based on how people interacted with this piece, the Mezbug by Felice Grodin, we could change the textures and skins and areas uh, beyond. Um, moving forward, uh, I'll start with a little bit of story, a uh, little bit of a story. So I'm from Boston, Massachusetts, and in the city of Boston, around 28 years ago, two men dressed up like police officers broke into the Isabella Stewart Gardner Museum, and they 
stole what equates to $500 million worth of art, the largest art heist in world history. Using X-Acto knives, they sliced through the frames and pulled masterworks like this Rembrandt here. And with the introduction of augmented reality and some new technical capabilities, I won't bore you with the details, but vertical surface detection and on-device machine vision, we were able to place the stolen digital works back into the frames um, at the Gardner. And this was really magical for people to experience because what we learned is a lot of people had no idea what the works looked like and if they had seen them it was kind of this emotional experience to see them brought back because as you can see in this little looping video the museum decided to leave the frames in place so you have this ghostly reminder of this culture that was previously there and i'm really excited to add that this was the most written about augmented reality project related to art and culture of 2018. There were about 150 publications that covered this and it brought up conversations around decolonizing the museum, repatriating art using virtual and digital means, and um, other, other elements as well. Um, it also landed a feature in Wired magazine discussing those topics in a story, Augmented Reality is Transforming Museums. And many heads of digital stepped up to say anything that aligns and furthers our mission as an institution and makes it as um, visible to as many eyes and audiences as possible is direct m mission fulfillment. So it kind of overcomes that age-old question of what happens when these you know, pesky kids come in and they start augmenting things without permission. We live in an age of permissionless innovation. We look at Uber, we look at Lime and Bird, the scooters on your streets, and those are all examples. So who owns this new digital or augmented commons? It's everybody. And um, one, I think maybe one last example is in conjunction with the Pioneers Festival, which is one of the largest tech and startup festivals in uh, Europe, and in conjunction with the Museum of Applied Arts in Vienna, we had the unique opportunity to infuse a little bit of culture into this otherwise tech and startup heavy conference. So inspired by Gustav Klimt and the fact that it was the 100 year anniversary since the death of Gustav Klimt and Egon Schiele and other Viennese modernists, we were able to bring the tree of life to life at a new scale for people to virtually plant the tree of life in the various parks and gardens throughout the city of, of Vienna. Um, and I think another instance is creating a new lens, so being able to augment uh, various works to basically annotate the world around you so that everyone who walks through a space has this new lens through which they can learn about culture in any language or context that they prefer. And it, for me, kind of strikes this point around accessibility and, and you know, museums becoming and staying relevant today is the object label. If you distill that back, what is the purpose of the object label? Why hasn't that evolved? Why is it only available in one language? Why is it only available in one size? If a non-sighted visitor walks through your doors or someone who doesn't speak you know, the native tongue, why should that be the case? Every bit of information, every story should be made available to every single person who walks through. And this led us to deep dive into the first comprehensive uh, survey of its kind to determine, well, what is the impact? We want to know beyond our feelings and the, you know, the excitement of people, what they were feeling. We found that close to nine out of 10 people surveyed said that it enhanced their experience made it more exciting, made learning more interesting, and that they would surely tell a friend. And so, you know, to take away from preconceived notions around, well, a mediated experience, we want less screens in the gallery, or what if the older patrons don't like this? We have data that proves that people are truly excited about these new mediums, whether it be augmented reality or virtual reality. Thank you very much. Um, oh, so and here's, here's all the press. If, if you guys are curious, there's lots of stories online about hacking the heist in particular. Um, Menno, um, the floor is yours, and I believe you have a video to show us. Is it working? Is it working? Yeah, okay. So um, I have a video, but before that I will, uh, I will speak. I will speak for a couple of moments. Uh, so first, thank the organization for inviting me. It's a pleasure to be here and to talk about the Anne Frank VR app. Uh, has any one of you ever been to Amsterdam and visited the Anne Frank House? Yeah? 
So uh, you must have noticed that the, the rooms are empty. There's no furniture. And this uh, VR app gave us a chance to show the rooms uh, furnished. So as they would have been during the time when Anne Frank was in hiding there. So there's, a, there's quite a unique uh, experience. It's available in seven languages. Uh, it takes about 25 minutes, that's max, because uh, people sometimes get a bit uh, nauseated by VR. You know, it's, it's not everyone's cup of tea. Um, and uh, there are two options. So either you can take a, a guided tour where you get an introduction, or you can go freely, you can move freely through the rooms. Well, more or less freely, because we're not that far yet that you can actually walk, but you are more or less transported from one point to the other. So it's very briefly about the VR app. Um, who developed it? Uh, we worked together with uh, Forcefield, a VR company in Amsterdam, and they brought in Oculus. So uh, you need an Oculus, uh, Oculus glasses to see this VR app. It's free, by the way. Um, who uses it? Well, if you've been to Amsterdam, you must have also seen that the stairs are quite, you know, quite steep. Not everyone can go up these stairs. So it's a, it's a service to uh, lesser abled visitors, you know, to get something out of their visit of the museum. You know, they cannot move up the stairs because it, we cannot change, we cannot move in an elevator or anything. So that's the, the first target group. Second, we work with it in educational groups and with our partner organizations in uh, New York, uh, Buenos Aires and Berlin. And of course, now we're testing the waters. I mean, this app was developed in June last year. So we're waiting to hear back, you know, what are people thinking? What, are, what is their experience? Uh, I just saw uh, an interesting reaction. That's, that's another reason why we made it. It's from Colombia. And someone saw the app there and said, you know, I cannot travel to Amsterdam, but this is as close as I can get to the Anne Frank house. And of course, that's our mission, you know, to, to spread this message as you know, as, as widely through the world as possible, and story. Um, so it's basically sort of a, a short overview. Of course, I, I could talk more about this. Uh, my work was mainly uh, being a curator to see to it that the narrative was all right and that the furniture was all right, because of course the, the sources that we have are limited. You know, there are no written uh, statements about Anne Frank about what was in each room. So we had to make uh, the furniture plausible. Okay, I should start to film now. When you visit a place like the Anne Frank house, you become aware that history is the work of human beings. What we need to learn, if we want to learn from history, is the fact that in each and every one of us, there is the capacity of doing terrible things. But there is always a choice. There's always a choice. When Otto Frank, Anne's father, came back to Amsterdam in 1945 and got the diary of his daughter and started to read it, he immediately knew that it should be a message to new generations. From that point of view, the Anne Frank House has always been an educational organization, very much focused on young people who we hope to help build a better world. What virtual reality can do is give people a sense of the house and how it looked like when Anne was in hiding, when she was writing her diary. And all of a sudden, the space starts to tell the story. When you can use virtual reality to transport people to the Anne Frank house, but also give them the authentic representation of what the actual house looked like when the eight people in hiding were there, I think that's where it all connected for us. Everybody who takes that experience gets a sense of what it must have been like for Anne, and I think there's no other way to do that than in virtual reality. The Anne Frank house does not limit itself to Amsterdam. We carry out many projects across the world with hundreds of thousands of young people. 
And this VR gives us the opportunity to share with them a house that they cannot physically visit. Now that I've been in her house, it feels like I've stepped into her life. It's not just um, written letters in a book anymore. It came to life. The past itself doesn't change. What does change are the questions we ask. To build up a future, you have to know the past. to add a few words or no? okay thank you very much uh, so David you have the floor hello everyone uh, is it working yes hello ev everyone um, uh, I have also a video to show you but I will uh, uh, I will introduce uh, my institution first um, so my name is David Collin I work for uh, the digital team uh, in the Centre des Monuments Nationaux so it, the institution is not very well known, even across France, but our monuments are uh, a lot more known by, uh, by everyone because we manage a hundred uh, all around the territory, uh, including uh, the Arc de Triomphe, the Mont Saint-Michel, uh, the Panthéon, the Sainte-Chapelle. So we have uh, plenty of monuments and manage them from top to bottom. We do restoration work, we do uh, ticketing, we do curating, and uh, in some of them we also have uh, AR and uh, uh, VR experience. Um, it's uh, it's a very uh, old institution, a hundred years old, that has been uh, created in order to help the smaller monuments that couldn't live uh, by themselves uh, by having uh, the money from the bigger ones. And with that system, we were able to develop even uh, AR experience for uh, smaller monuments and the one that I will uh, present to you in a minute is the house of Georges Clemenceau who was a French politician that was uh, that was famous especially for being the father of victory during uh, World War I and uh, at the end of his life he retired in a small house uh, near the ocean and the house is uh, almost intact. Uh, we still have all his belongings. We have his room, we have his books, we have his desk. And the only thing we needed to add was uh, the character uh, of uh, Georges Clemenceau. And that's how we uh, started to think of developing an AR project. And the, the thing is that we decided to try another uh, approach of the technology of the augmented reality and instead of using uh, 3D models to represent him we uh, choose to use uh, 360 videos that we shoot it on site uh, with actors uh, to in order to uh, represent his life uh, at uh, when he was uh, living in this house so we can uh, start the video thanks ah vous êtes là Je suis sûr que vous aussi, vous aimez le homard, n'est-ce pas Moi, j'adore. Ici, à la Maison Clémenceau, nous avons créé le tout premier biopic à vivre à l'endroit même où a vécu cette grande personnalité. On est vieux qu'à partir du moment où on prend parti d'être vieux. Et de toute façon, je crois que je ne pourrai jamais arrêter de travailler. Quand on visite le kiosque de la maison, on va voir Clémenceau avec son ami Monet en train de contempler son jardin. Je n'aurais jamais cru que cette terre soit aussi fertile. Non mais la France est un pays très fertile, vous n'aviez pas remarqué On y plante des fonctionnaires et il y pousse des impôts. <rire> So this, um, this experience is one of the different we developed in our monuments. Um, uh, on the, the 100 monuments, uh, we have all 
kind of uh, buildings and even small museums. It uh, goes from the Neolithic period to uh, 1932, which is the one that has been the most recently, which is the Villa Cavrois in the north, which also has a IR, AR experience. So um, it's uh, we have various uh, topics to work on, and this one uh, was the most recent one we uh, released it in September uh, last year. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, so I'm gonna I'm gonna ask you, all of you a few questions uh, to start the debate, and uh, then before the end, I will give the uh, audience uh, the, the opportunity to ask questions. So I, I I trust you to find the first question at least, and then the others will come naturally. Um, so uh, first, uh, I was wondering how you can satisfy both the geeks and the non-geeks uh, in your institutions because uh, the, the the publics are really different, and uh, it's it, I think it's very hard to to address both of the uh, uh, technological friendly and non-friendly? Well, most of the projects that we've worked on have been for the broadest audience possible. If you build something for geeks, you're only going to get the geeks. You really need to look at who the general audience is and get a good read on simple, intuitive experiences that you can create. So even with the, um, the AR survey to determine was this impactful? Is this beneficial to the experience? Uh, what we found was an overwhelming number of non-geeky uh, visitors found this most interesting and most helpful. So it was people who, this might have been their first uh, run-in with augmented reality, in general, found it incredibly useful. It wasn't just geeks. Thank you. I think that uh, what happens, what we try and do, is to build an experience that actually encompasses all kinds of populations. In other words, to build an experience that someone who is not necessarily technologically oriented, but perhaps might be older, I mean, we have 500,000 visitors a year from the ages of 90 to two months old. Um, so we try and integrate both kinds of uh, things inside an experience. Right now, we're working together with local projects from, uh, from New York the people who, de the design team who developed the 9-11 museum. Um, we're working to, to, to have an archeological experience where part of it takes place in a gallery and part of it is an immersion into a real archeological re uh, reality, virtual reality. And we kind of said the grandparents will we'll mediate the, uh, the gallery for the, for the younger generation, while the younger generation will show grandma and grandpa how to turn on the, the headphones. So we're, we're trying to do it like that. Thank you. Um, madam? Um, well, I... Okay. So uh, um, I think uh, if I ask you who has Oculus glasses, I, pr I presume not many have them. So we would not have done this project if we wouldn't have uh, reused these furnished rooms for a website. So we really wanted to uh, uh, reach as many people as possible because also for an organization it's quite an, an investment in staff and time to develop something like this. So we wouldn't have done it if we, if we didn't have this, this sort of this broader opportunity to show these furnished rooms. David? Well, um, for us, AR is a tool, a very uh, useful one, but it will not uh, respond to all of our audience. So basically, we are trying to implement as many tools as we can for our public, uh, meaning that we will have AR available, but we'll also have guidebooks, we also have guides, and what I think is that AR will never uh, replace uh, the human that will uh, help you and guide you through the monuments and tell you all the little stories that are behind the monuments. So we are not trying to um, uh, aim at the geek people or non-geek people. We are trying to aim at the broader audience and uh, offer them as many tools as we can. Okay. Um, Rose, when we prepared this panel, you told me that um, you... you sometimes don't have enough resources to hire uh, like veteran developers, for example. Uh, so how do you manage with limited resources? Actually, our whole experiment, our whole journey into uh, technology has really been done on a shoestring. We don't have the kinds of resources that many, many of these projects demand, but what we do have, we have a site 
as I said, we have 500,000 visitors from all over the world. What we've managed to do is make connections, connections with young developers, connections with small startups. We offer our site as a testing site, as a beta site, for them to develop, uh, for them to develop their projects. And we have a fabulous PR system. We have fabulous contacts with people within the community, and it becomes very attractive for these developers. So for example, our virtual reality tour of Jerusalem, it was a project that cost almost $100,000, but the developers themselves, Lithodomus out of uh, Australia, they uh, found backers who were willing to, to back the project as an experiment to see how it would work in a museum. So you have to be very, very creative, I think, we're using technology. Do you want to react? Mm -hmm. the, I mean, the cost around developing for augmented reality, virtual reality, and mixed reality has really plummeted over the last five years when Apple and Google stepped up, when the de prices of the devices started to decrease, when the power on the device of your own phone became strong enough to support a lot of these experiences, you know, the hefty license around supporting that technology basically vanished and the number of eager startups and developers, creative technologists stepped up to the plate because everybody wants to jump in and I think culture allows for this really beautiful outlet where you're furthering, you know, the historical significance of a story or the artistic expression of a project um, in ways that a lot of technologists, you know, are heads down into the code building things for commercial gain only find to be really interesting. So it's an opportune time for any cultural institution to have those conversations in their community because I can guarantee there's an agency or a dev shop that is eager and excited to find a way to make it work. Okay, and uh, David, you told me that uh, you're trying to do VR with minimum, minimum HR. <laughs> Yes, and uh, in our monuments, too, the main uh, difficulty is to have uh, human resources to help uh, people putting on the, the helmet, uh, removing it, explaining how, how it works. So uh, we are uh, really uh, thinking about finding solutions to, uh, to, to that. And the mixed reality is also a good answer uh, for that, as people can move around freely and... Uh, experience a uh, virtual uh, world uh, although it's not as it may be not as immersive as VR but still as interesting uh, capacities do you want to react me now I think I you think don't you don't have to no no it's okay <laughs> no, it's fine, it's fine. Uh -huh. oh, okay um, uh, well the next question for you maybe uh, so how, where do you draw the line between useful tech and uh, tech sexiness I, mean, I, I guess uh, sometimes uh, it doesn't bring something more but just uh, PR uh, well I, th I think yeah it's okay okay well, um, uh, you know in, in my field the field where I work we have to be really careful and tread very lightly because of the subject matter sure. I mean, uh, for an organization such as the Anne Frank House, you know, this VR is already a, a, a big step. You know, should we do it? Shouldn't we do it? How will people respond? So, so I'm I'm not that worried that we that we will overstep this line because we always have to be careful. Can I add to yeah, that? Yeah, sure. I know. Um, I think all museums, because in a certain sense, we talked about this. We are arbiters of 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 culture or art or history, or at least we hope we are, um, everything has to be exact. I know that our VR tour of, uh, of Jerusalem 2,000 years ago was done by archaeologists, and that's something else that has to be taken into account. If you're going to be presenting something in a museum and you're presenting it as reality, then it has to have the documentation behind it. And uh, and that was uh, that was a we were very lucky to work with a with a firm that respected that and puts it high on their priority. But I think that's something that's very interesting in all in all uh, in all um, areas of culture that we have to take into account. Well, I think this is a, a such an important conversation because we've seen what has happened at organizations like the Metropolitan Museum of Art, you know, in overspending in digital 
the the space you know just like any space on earth certainly suffers from a sexy shiny object syndrome where you see something or your director sees something at one museum and they want to replicate it and it often comes down to in, in many cases present company excluded because these all have great purpose the in, in, of the use case suffer from a you know hammer looking for a nail versus the nail looking for a hammer so a solution looking for for uh, a problem and I think you know at the end of the day if you can satisfy what I think others have described as like the 8 and 80 rule if this is useful and intuitive for someone who's eight years old and someone who's 80 years old and does truly align with your mission and shows people something that they couldn't otherwise experience, um, then it's worthy doing if you can do it on a shoestring budget and take kind of iterative steps forward. I think we need to rid ourselves of these grandiose three-year big, lofty, sexy projects and really focus on what can we what can we iterate on, what can we learn from that will guide us. And I think a lot of cultural institutions are starting to embrace what we describe as agile to do these kind of lean experiments. Okay. No, okay. Um, how, how do you include uh, tech that gets old in a few months uh, inside exhibitions that take years to create sometimes? Uh, is there a problem in here? Uh, um, I've also worked on, on traveling exhibits, and you know, uh, they have to be as low tech as possible because, you know, uh, things get damaged, things get stolen. I mean, it's, uh, you know, we really have to hold back on tech, for example, in, in traveling exhibits. So, uh, really careful there. So, uh, do you take uh, steps to, uh, to prevent... Uh, yeah, just to, to keep them as simple and, as, and robust as possible, okay. you know, and, uh, yeah. Okay. Rose? I think we always have to remember that content is key and content is king. And if you have good content, that it's going to survive a little bit of the older technology. I know that now our museum is 30 years old. 30 years ago, it was heralded as the height of technology. We have widescreen television sets from 1989. <laughs> we have holograms where you can kind of look and see something. And it was considered high tech, but it still works. Even though now we are, we are renewing the museum, but it still works because the content works. And if you give the right content, then the technology is the asset, but it's not what you're coming to see. David? Um, it's a bit different for us because uh, we manage monuments and not museums. So it's the building we are uh, putting, uh, we are uh, showing to, uh, to uh, the visitors. Therefore, uh, the building is not moving a lot. So when we create an uh, AR experience, it's uh, usually staying. And if we build exhibitions inside the monuments, we will uh, always manage to um, to have the two experiences uh, doable at the same time. Okay, uh, Brendan, you, you, what's um, in your opinion? What's the impact of uh, AR and general accessibility? Um, great question. So a lot of what we've investigated has been directly in line and aligned with some of the high priority items have been in the museum sector around inclusion, diversity, accessibility from a wide range. So looking solely at how can technology be put in place quickly, easily, and affordably to tackle one of these items or multiple of these items is really important to us as a company. And so looking at the dynamic of being in a museum in an American city, for instance, where 50% of your population speaks Spanish, but your object labels are in English, that has huge implications around inaccessibility and serving of your community. So, you know, in the example I showed of questioning that object label and saying, can this be made available for anybody who walks through who's sighted, non-sighted, hard of hearing, or um, speaks a different language is really important to think about. And if those can be accomplished using today's tools, um, then we should do it. And, and what you know has been true to look at is just how powerful um, artificial intelligence has become for understanding language and translating it into languages, uh, other languages, which aid in general language accessibility, um, as well as just the ease of use. And I think it comes down to that simplicity moment. And that's been really, you know, a growing area of interest and concern 
um, in the in the cultural arena, and augmented reality has great potentials in, in addressing it. Okay, do you want to? Um, we have, I mean, when we talk about accessibility, it depends on uh, what uh, type of uh, people you're aiming at. For um, for rain people who doesn't who don't speak the the same language, it's a great tool. I mean, AR can be translated easily, and they will be able to uh, give them a lot of content. For uh, for people with uh, mobility problems, it's also very uh, useful for with uh, the VR project because they can uh, access space uh, where they uh, cannot go usually. Um, for the other kind of disabilities, it's uh, always a bit more touchy. Uh, for instance, for uh, deaf people, we we have um, this uh, sign language that we implement in some of our project, but it's not always easy to have uh, an image of the monument and someone uh, speaking the sign lang language at the same time. So um, it's, uh, and for the visually impaired, of course, it's a lot more complicated than its other tools that we'll uh, provide. So basically, it's always the tools that you can offer to your, to your audience. And um, AR answers some of the, uh, of the problems we encounter with accessibility but uh, not all of them, of course. So we have to offer multiple tools to our public, I think. Okay. Um, we, we, we spoke earlier about uh, being careful sometimes and uh, low-tech projects, but um, do, do you remember any case where you could have done uh, things with technology and you chose uh, to make a tech-free project instead or, or you had uh, maybe a request by the visitors to, to keep uh, some areas tech-free? Not at all. <laughs> no. Um, no, I think it's, uh, if we could use tech in every ex exhibit, I think we would, uh, to give it as a choice to people. I think it's really driven by uh, economics uh, yeah. in that sense. And it's an optional technology. I mean, a lot of these things, you're not forcing someone to engage with that tool. You're not forcing them to put on that head-mounted display or to download the app or access something on a device. So like with so many things, you know, similar enough with the gallery guide that's printed on paper, Paper, people make the choice of what works best for them, what has the greatest value proposition and really resonates with them that they would want to engage. And I think that's the beauty of it. It's very democratic. It's very, you know, opt-in. Menno? Yeah, I would like to add that, you know, that, uh, for example, for the Anne Frank House, um, uh, you know, we, we, we cannot have AR because it would destroy the atmosphere of the museum. So we really have to hold back there and, you know, in my mind, it should be a quiet museum about reflection. So, uh, to be honest, for us, having an audio guide was already a big step, you know, uh, in that in that direction. So, that's as far as tech in the in the Anne Frank House goes at this moment. Thank you very much, and uh, enjoy your day.